Hello everyone, welcome to this video where we're going to be looking at an interesting application for cable elements, uh, tensegrity structure, uh, which relies on kind of a unique combination of cable elements, tension only members effectively, uh, to support itself in what looks to be a gravity defying way. We're going to dive into this a little bit further, but we're also going to look at how we can set this model up in S-Frame. Now I'm starting a little bit past the original starting point. I've got the geometry already set up. You'll notice here that I've got a shell element mesh. Uh, this is actually a concrete shell element mesh on the top and bottom. And I've also got a couple beam elements. So these beam elements have given them a dimension of 300 millimeters squared. Uh, and they're using a material property that's effectively making it rigid, uh, relatively rigid to everything else in the model. You'll notice I have a cable section assigned to my cable elements. I'm going to just dive into the member types tool and we can see that for these cable elements I've got a pre-stress of 10 kilonewtons. So these cables are pre-tensioned effectively to uh, have some tension in them before we actually start the analysis. And I'm going to be modeling this um, and these loads using what we call a nonlinear quasi-static uh, approach. So this is similar to a pushover analysis. We can actually run a pushover analysis with the nonlinear quasi-static analysis. However, the nonlinear quasi-static analysis is a more general approach. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a variety of different loads, self-weight and then a couple push loads, and I'm going to look at uh, sequencing those in a nonlinear quasi-static uh, method that allows me to apply the loading very slowly, so we're ignoring the dynamic effects, uh, we're looking at more long-term effects, ignoring damping, for example, and we'll be able to see how that's done. So I'm going to start off in the loads window by just creating a couple load cases. I'll create a self-weight load case, I'm going to create two more, I'm going to call this one push x, and one final one here, push y. So my self-weight load case, that one's self-explanatory. I should actually go into this uh, load status and make sure that I've got my gravitational factor of negative one in the z direction. And update that. And that one's taken care of. Uh, but what I want to do for my push x and push y is I'm basically going to just apply an arbitrary uh, force in the x and y direction. So I'll say that in the x direction here, I have a load of one kilonewton is going to be applied right into the center of this uh, shell element mesh. And for the next low case, push Y, I'm going to do the same thing, same magnitude, but obviously that's going to be in the other direction, in the Y axis. And what my goal is, is to represent kind of a, a realistic situation that a, a tensegrity structure might be faced with, which is obviously it has to support its own gravitational loads, its self-weight. But then let's say what happens if somebody pushes it in one direction, lets it go, and then pushes it in the other direction. And by it, I mean this top plate. We're assuming here that the base of this model is fully supported. So we're just assuming that uh, I want to make those intentions clear, or those assumptions clear. So how do we approach this? Well, we can use this tool at the bottom of this loads tool list. It's called the nonlinear quasi-static loading used in nonlinear analysis. And we do need a nonlinear analysis to capture this behavior for a couple of different reasons. First of all, we have cable elements. Uh, and cable elements, they support axial load only, but specifically they only support tensile loads. They have no stiffness and compression. So SRAM using nonlinear analysis can determine if it's in tension or compression and assign its stiffness relative to that uh, status. So if it's in compression, it's not gonna have any stiffness. If it's in tension, it's gonna have stiffness uh, but also, we need to consider the uh, geometric behavior that's occurring during a nonlinear analysis. As this model deflects, as we'll see later on, we're going to get some perhaps unexpected, although it does make sense, uh, unexpected deformations. I'm not going to go into that too much, but again, we'll have to be able to run a nonlinear analysis to capture those. Uh, linear static analysis doesn't do that, it doesn't look at the changing geometry throughout the load application. So let's go ahead and use this tool. I'm going to start off by switching to my self-weight load case. And I'm going to right click on this nonlinear quasi-static loading used in uh, nonlinear analysis. And here I can set up my load curves. 
So I've actually done this already ahead of time. I've got this self-weight load curve, and we can click on this chart button to see what this looks like. Basically, it's just a curve that I've set up to describe how this load is going to be applied. So I'm assuming at uh, time equals zero, zero seconds, I have a my self-weight load is going to be zero. And I'm going to gradually ramp it up over the duration of one second until it reaches its 100% magnitude. So it has a factor of one. And you can see that's described here in this table. So at time equals zero, I have a scale of zero. Time equals one, I have a scale of one. And I'm keeping this analysis duration for 12 seconds. So this factor, uh, scale factor is going to be applied for 12 seconds. And this self-weight curve has been applied to the self-weight uh, load case. So we're going to see this self-weight take effect gradually, and it's just going to be maintained throughout the rest of the analysis. Now let's switch to our other load case, our push X load case. And for this one here, if I just right click on the nonlinear quasi-static load uh, tool again, I actually have a different load case, or a different curve. I have this push X curve, and you can see here what this looks like. So basically, where my self-weight load case originally would have started at zero and gone up to one over the course of the first one second of analysis, this one is actually waiting until time equals three seconds to start. It ramps up, it's held steady for one second, and then it ramps back down. So you can kind of think of this as we're pushing this, we're holding it, and then we're letting go and letting it return to its self-weight equilibrium. So I'll click OK to accept this and apply it to that load case. And the last load case here is the push Y load case. And this one, as we can see, looks almost identical to the previous one. However, it's just been offset. So by the time the push X load has been ramped up and then ramped back down, we have a one second gap where only the self weight is occurring and then we have our push Y low case uh, occurring. So I'm basically just pushing it in the other direction. So again, just to remind ourselves, the sequence of events is we ramp up our self-weight, which is going to be held constant after one second for the entire analysis duration. Then with that self-weight in effect, we're then going to push the top panel in the X direction, hold it for one second, and then let it go. After we let it go, we leave just the self-weight in effect for one second, then we push the load, uh, or the top panel rather, in the y-axis, just as we did previously in the x-axis, hold it for one second and then let it go. And again, it will just be self-weight in effect. So I'm just going to click OK. And we also have a load combination to look at the effects of all of these loads together. So I can click on load combinations. And here we can see here that I can define a load combination. Uh, in this case here, I'm going to call this self-weight plus push X plus push Y. And I'm going to add these to my model. So I'll just say they're all factored with a factor of one. And this will be considered during the sequencing where we look at them all together. Now to analyze this model, I'm going to go to the run menu and go to analyze. And you'll notice that I'm running a different analysis type than you may be used to seeing. So this is a nonlinear quasi-static analysis. Like I mentioned, the loading is going to be implied uh, without the effects of damping. We're not going to see oscillations as we remove the loads. Uh, we're assuming that, again, these loads are applied very lowly, looking at long-term effects, uh, very slowly, rather, and looking at long-term effects. I've set this up to use a time step size of 0 0.01 seconds. And remember, my analysis duration, or my load duration, was 12 seconds. So that's, I've got 1,200 time steps and 0 0.01 second time step size. So I should have every second basically represented by 100 time steps. And I'm going to go ahead and run the analysis now. And the analysis is solved. You'll notice here that we get a message uh, at the bottom here. It's just saying FYICO087. Uh, and it's just indicating here a cable, perhaps more, have become inactive, which, as you'll see later on, it makes sense, but it's not something that uh, we'll explore right away.
You'll also notice here all the different loading commits that have been analyzed. Uh, and because we're running a nonlinear quasi-static analysis, we can actually look at each one of these load increments as an individual load case and look at the uh, status of the model during that uh, particular stage in the load sequencing. So I'm just going to click any key to proceed here. Now that this analysis is complete, the nonlinear quasi-static analysis, I'm going to look at some of the results. Uh, before I jump into S-View, I do want to point out here that because we had a number of different time steps in the analysis, we can see here under the load combination that I solved for that we have our parent load combination, self-weight plus push x plus push y. And then underneath that, we have a child load combination for every single load step uh, during the analysis. So load step number one is at basically point zero of my analysis. And proceeding through the analysis until I get to the bottom with 1,200 different load steps. And so each one of these represents a different increment in that nonlinear uh, quasi-static uh, analysis. Now let's just jump into S view here. I'm going to go to the run menu and in S view. And I want to use this as an opportunity to showcase some of the results a little bit more clearly. Let me change this to object view. And we can get an nice idea of uh, the relative size of each one of our sections. And I'm going to change the result here. I didn't solve for the low case. It's just a low combination. So I'll click on low combination. And I can click the play button and see how this is deflecting. And it's all happening fairly fast, but hopefully we get a bit of an idea of what's going on. Let me maybe slow this down a little bit more. And with this slow down animation here, let's just click play again. And remember, before we start, the sequencing of our loads. So we started with our all of our loads being zero, and then we gradually added the self-weight loading. We held that self-weight loading steady throughout the whole analysis. And then we were able to then add the push X load. We applied that after the self-weight loading had been in effect. We added the push X load, then we removed it. And we're gonna do the same thing with the push Y after the push X has been removed. We're gonna add the push Y and then we're gonna remove it. So let's see what this looks like again in a slower animation. So you can hear this is where the self-weight loading is taking effect. You can see it is leaning to the side because we do have asymmetric mass distribution. And we're pushing it in the x-direction and removing that load. And then we're pushing it in the y-direction again and removing that load. So we can see here it's taking effect in each case. So again, just to go through this once more, we're starting with the self-weight. It's being ramped up and held. Then we're pushing it in the x-axis. It's reaching that magnitude of, and then removing it. And then we're pushing it in the y-axis, holding it there for a second and then moving it back. And something that wasn't apparent to me when I first saw these uh, tensegrity structures in real life is due to the asymmetric nature of the system here that's hanging from this cable, we are going to get some deformation. And this wouldn't actually be captured in a linear analysis. If we were just running a linear analysis, we're looking at basically uh, you know, forces and the deflections based off of the starting point of our analysis. Whereas a nonlinear analysis, is going to be able to capture the change in geometry, which in this case actually has a fairly large influence on how the model is actually behaving. Uh, and it's causing this um, lateral deformation just from the self-weight loading. So even though we do have downward loads with the self-weight, the deformation is coming in due to the asymmetry of the, uh, the mass and uh, naturally how the structure is hanging off of that cable, essentially. Now let's go back into S-Frame. And I'm going to go to the graphical results window. And in the graphical results window, we can actually query the model for some more useful information. If I wanted to look at the forces in my cables, I can do that as well from the nonlinear quasi static analysis. I can right click, and here I can click on response time history. And for this cable uh, at the center, which is doing the majority of the work with all these cables, we can actually see here that we are getting uh, the ramp up in the load starting from zero tension. This is force in X or axial force. 
It's starting at zero, tension. It's ramping up once the self-weight is added. Then the self-weight is held there. Then I push it in the X direction, and you can see that the uh, forces in that cable actually increase a little bit before I remove it. And we don't see a great deal of change when we push it in the Y direction. Now that's just one example. Let's look at another cable. And here I can see the response time history for this cable here. And this one may be a little bit more telling. So we can see here that it's moving up uh, in this axis here, the vertical axis. This is the axial load. So as the self-weight is being added, starting at zero, it's gradually added over the duration of one second. And then it's just basically leveling out. And there's no further loads being added from time one to time three seconds. At time three seconds, we're pushing it in the x direction. So naturally, this cable here is going to be going into more tension. That load is obviously increasing, and it's held steady, and then we let it go. And when we push it in the y direction, this cable actually reduces the amount of tension that it has, uh, because the direction it's being pushed in, this is actually not going into compression, but it's getting less tension based off the, the actions of the model. So we can see that as well when we actually superimpose the animated uh, model. So let me go back into S-View. And we can see here it is getting going into tension when we add that self-weight loading. When we push in the X direction, it's getting a little bit more tension. And when we push it in the Y direction, we're getting a little bit of, not slack, but a little bit less tension in that case before it's removed. Now, if I wanted to study this axial load in my model a little bit more uh, carefully, I can actually look at uh, different load steps of my model and look at the axial loads using the axial force tool in S-Ring. I'm going to actually just highlight my selection here. I'm going to unselect everything and just select the cable elements, since those are of most interest to me. And I've selected a load case here. This is the load case uh, 102, which includes basically load step 101. Uh, if you recall from my analysis, I set up 1,200 uh, load steps uh, with a 0 0.01 second time increment uh, for each one. And uh, my overall analysis duration was 12 seconds. So to get to the one second point where my self-weight load magnitude has reached its full uh, magnitude, I'm at load step 101. So that's why I chose this load case. And I can click on the axial force diagram tool and I can see the axial force diagram just looking at the self-weight loading. And what's of interest here is looking at the relative magnitudes. So I can see this is in newtons, so we're looking at around 63 kilonewtons of load in this particular cable, uh, the short one that is doing most of the heavy lifting here. And we also have some tension in these cables as well uh, on the left-hand side of my model. But if I actually select one of the other cables here on the right-hand side, and I right-click and go to Properties, here I can see for that load case that the axial load magnitude is actually zero, uh, which is supporting the fact that the way this is tilting, these loads or these cables are actually going to go slack, uh, at least for the self-weight loading. Maybe if we added other loads in other directions, these would go, wouldn't go slack. But these are going to go slack here because this whole top panel here is tipping over and compressing this cable. Whereas this one is going into compression, or tension rather, and I can look at these values and see the magnitudes uh, associated with that. And let's just remind ourselves that cables can support tension, but they can't support any compression. They also can't support any moments or shear forces. And if we wanted to dive into these loads a little bit more and look beyond just the cables, here, let me just select the entire structure, and we're looking at the axial force, as you can see. What's clear to this, or from this view, is that obviously this middle cable that is effectively connecting the two uh, beam elements together is under the most tension. You can see the tension uh, tensile force of 6,300 uh, or 63,000 newtons, 63 kilonewtons, essentially, and Next to that, we have these beam elements that are resisting compression. So basically, that middle cable is trying to pull everything closer together, and those beam elements are trying to spread everything apart uh, or resist the 
the tensile forces uh, in the cables themselves. Again, this is assumed to be a rigid system. However, the actual cables on the exterior and around the perimeter here aren't really resisting much of any load, as we've seen. Uh, it's really there more for stability because, as we mentioned, in the real world, this type of structure does have an eccentricity to its mass distribution, and we're getting some uh, lateral deformations that are occurring. So these tensile forces are being recruited from uh, these two cables on the outside uh, to resist that. But let's just look at another example here. And in this example, I've rendered it just for illustration. You can see here that I've got kind of an extension to what I had in the previous example. Uh, this is using essentially two U-shaped um, hooks, if you will, that are crossing through one another and there's a cable connecting them just to allow for some symmetry. And I'll turn off the rendering here and we'll look at the axial forces. And this is just due to self-weight. I haven't looked at uh, the other loads here. And what do we notice? Well, we notice, first of all, the same general mechanism. We have tension in this cable, which is to be expected, and compression throughout uh, the vertical beams but we're not getting actually any axial loads in these exterior cables, which in, again, this fantasy world where we're assuming that we don't have any lateral deformation or lateral loads, like me pushing it, for example, uh, or even any irregularities in the construction. The things might be not perfectly up and down, not perfectly plumb, for example. Uh, in that situation, we might be able to get by without those perimeter cables. Hopefully this was insightful for you. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about nonlinear analysis or cables in S-Frame, a great place to look is our nonlinear uh, analysis and applications in S-Frame training course. It's available on demand through the Altair 1 Learning Management System.